So glad to be with you today. I'm Lou Perez, lead pastor of Destiny Christian Church, and we're so excited about what God is doing uh, during this crisis. Uh, we can have the worst time in the world, but when we have God, there is a joy and there is a breakthrough to, to having him in your life. And so today we're going to be enjoying uh, some post-Easter time together. Uh, we're still sort of in Easter season, Easter mode, and we're in the middle of a series called The Lord's Prayer. And as we engage this series, as we engage in scripture today and worship and, and a couple of videos, we just want you to sit back and enjoy God's presence and pray with us and worship with us and, and just encounter Jesus with us together. Good morning. Uh, we're going to be reading from Psalms 103, starting in verses 19 through 22. So please join with me as we read this from the word of God. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, obedient to his spoken word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers that do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Lord that we come to you this morning knowing that your kingdom is forever and it endures unshaken and unshakable. Father, in this kingdom that you have placed in our hearts is unshakable. And Father God, during these times, Lord, that everything around us seems to be going in the opposite direction of what is right, Father, we know that the kingdom of heaven is a sure place. We know that your word is a solid foundation that we can stand on. So, Father God, this morning I would ask that you would bless every individual that is listening to this prayer, Father, that they would join together with me and they would petition you to say to you, bless the Lord, O my soul, for you are good and your grace never ends. Your mercy is forever and ever and that your kingdom cannot be shaken. For we have received a kingdom that is full of power and glory and majesty, which is of you. So, Father God, this morning we would ask as we participate in this service, Father, that you would just speak to every one of our hearts, that you would show us that you have empowered us with the power of the Holy Spirit. You have given us your nature, and you have given us your hope, and you have given us everything from the kingdom of heaven that will see us through any time that we enter into, including this time and this season that we are in right now. So, Father, in this time and at this time, I would just like to say, God, we love you, and we bless you, and we worship you, and we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. And all my days I've been held in your hand. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up, until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath. Of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I will sing of the goodness of God. So all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so
the goodness of God. Oh, I'm going to sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Cause your goodness is running after, it's running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so. Of the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. We're going to be reading from Psalms 145, verses 3 through 21. So follow along. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall laud your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed and I will declare your greatness. They shall celebrate the frame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hands, satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all his ways and kind in all his doings. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of all who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever.
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So this morning we're doing a series called The Lord's Prayer. And it's found in Matthew 6, 19, and also in Luke also. And uh, as we engage this series, we talked about the first week that Jesus gave us the f familiar, intimate way to call God when we pray, and that is the term Father. God wants us to see him as the Father of all things, not like a, a Father that maybe hurt us or, or abused us in some way, but as the Heavenly Father who loves us and has our best interest in mind. Then Jesus gives the first petition in the prayer by saying, hallowed be your name, hallowed be your name. In other words, we're going to lay your name aside to worship it, to worship how great and awesome you are. And we find that that is the first petition of, of the Lord's Prayer. But today, we're going to talk about the second petition of the Lord's Prayer. And that is, your kingdom come. And that's found in verse 10 of Matthew 6. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we find that the Lord is now looking for God He's saying, okay, now you've worshiped God and, and you've, you've hallowed his name and you, you, you see him as father, but now it's important that we begin to invite God and to pray to him and ask him to work in the world now. This is his world. He created it. And now we must invite him to work in the world in his mighty power. So what is the kingdom this morning when he says your kingdom come? It sounds like such a, a lofty term. It sounds like something that's way out there uh, in, in some kind of fantasy land. But the kingdom is not just a territory, but it is the rule of God. There are so many scriptures that talk about God being the Lord of the universe, the God of the universe, that he created all things. So God is already the owner of all things, but now he wants to bring his ownership, his kingdom to the hearts of people because not everyone wants him to rule their hearts and uh, for whatever reason. And... Uh, you know, John the Baptist preached this. He said, repent for the kingdom is near. Repent for the kingdom is near. Repent and believe. And we find that although God's kingdom uh, is everywhere, it's still not here. It's still not in some of us. It's still not ruling in some of our hearts. And God wants us to, to be part of, of, of what he's doing in the world and in the universe. And uh, so because even though God is, is sovereign in the universe... He still invites us to partake of his kingdom with him. But to do that, he must rule our hearts. It's not about going to church. It's not about being a, a good little boy or a good little girl. It's about letting his kingdom rule your heart. But then there's a problem, a problem we all face, especially being Western, especially being American, and that is the idea of American individualism, American ruggedness, that all I have to do is be tough and, you know, uh, pull up my bootstraps and just get it done, and our ingenuity will get it done. And there's something to be said about that, about determination. That's nice and all that. However, this, this kingdom idea for someone with that mindset, which is most of us, I think, bristles. It bristles at us because this kingdom idea implies that God is actually in charge of everything. And that is a big deal. And one of the great American symbols of freedom and individualism started out as a motto during the Revolutionary War, and it was the flag that read this, don't tread on me. And pictured is, is a serpent uh, in defiance saying, don't, don't you step on me. And it's, it's saying, you're not in charge of my life. You don't get to you know, put me down. And it spoke of patriotism, personal freedom, and it spoke of individuality. And uh, other symbols are like the Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell are great symbols of freedom. And it's great to be free. We believe in freedom. However, with that, there's a God of the universe that says, my kingdom is coming. Will you be part of it? And Dr. R.C. Sproul tells of the English friend he had who, who came from England. 
and uh, to the States uh, to take a tour and check everything out. And he, he went to museums, he went to historical sites, and uh, he was at a gift shop where he saw this sign, this plaque that said, we serve no sovereign here. And the thought that hit him was this. He wondered, and he kind of scratched his head at the idea of how such a rugged and individualistic culture will navigate the idea that God is actually the sovereign of the universe. So when God says, pray for the kingdom to come, it's not just fluff. He's saying, pray that my rule, my rule comes to the world and to your hearts. And there's a famous old song by Bob Dylan that says, you got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you got to serve somebody. And there's a truth to that. And the truth is this, that whoever I pray to, that when I, if I say your kingdom come, it tells me that I'm aligning with God and his kingdom. And if I don't believe in his kingdom, then I'm choosing, I'm making a choice. But the kingdom is also this. It's, it's not a location, but it's a connection. It's a connection. And this is what I mean by that. Uh, J.R. Packer said, God's kingdom is not a place, but rather a relationship. It exists where people enthrone Jesus as Lord of their lives. And that's a beautiful way to say that, that this is why Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered, there I am. His kingdom happens where people enthrone him in their lives. And there's a clash of kingdoms that is happening all the time in the world. It's not just about a religious right or religious left or, or political left or, or however you want to slice it up. It's about God's kingdom clashing with the kingdoms of the world. Let your kingdom come. When we pray that, we are in a way inadvertently saying, Lord, let there be a clash between the kingdoms of God and the kingdoms that rule this world because God's kingdom will rule over all eventually. So it's saying that all the world must come under the sway of God. The whole universe comes under his power and sovereignty as king of the universe. And one of my favorite parts of, 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 of Handel's Messiah is, and he shall reign forever and ever, and he shall reign forever and ever. And that is the part where everyone stands up in respect and reverence and in awe of the King of kings and Lord of lords. A rabbi's prayer book puts it this way, therefore we bow down and worship and thank the supreme King of kings, the Holy One. Blessed be he who extends the heavens and establishes the earth. This is the kingdom, but the kingdom also, it is here, but it's not here in its fullness. When Jesus came, the kingdom was, was inaugurated. It was starting. And look at it this way, that when a new president is elected, there's always this gap between his election and his inauguration. And when Jesus was elected by the Father, there was a gap. And his election happened when he went to the cross. And since then, there's this gap till the fullness of the kingdom happens, even though the kingdom is here in seed forms. And, and it, it breaks in here and there through the darkness, here and there, when you see miracles, when you see salvations, when you see justice happening in the world, when you see things breaking that could never break. That's the kingdom of God breaking in on the earth. The kingdom is here presently in every follower of Jesus. And it breaks in on the darkness. It breaks in on the hopelessness. But its fullness has not yet come until Christ returns to the world again. So what does the kingdom not mean today? When we say kingdom, here's what we don't mean. The kingdom does not mean better ethics, better morals, better church services, or times of praise. It doesn't mean a better theological argument. It doesn't mean better politics or, or better government solutions. The kingdom means that God is here to rule and reign on the earth. And the new kingdom means a mega shift in the cosmos from darkness to light. So the kingdom does some things. It, it initiates some things. It confronts evil and it brings true freedom. When I say freedom, I don't mean freedom to do as we please, but it's freedom from, from the bondage, from the bondage of life, freedom from the things that, that destroy us, freedom from sin. Luke eleven twenty one, Jesus gives a parable of himself, of what he came to do in the world by confronting evil. He says, when a strong man, fully armed, 
guards his castle. His property is safe. But when a stronger man or, or, or one stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his plunder. And this is what Jesus came to do against the power of darkness, against Satan, because this world has been under the sway of Satan, but Jesus came and confronted that evil. And this is what Jesus did when he came into the world. He confronted the strong man. And we all have strong men that we fight in our lives. We have Goliaths that we have to face of evil. And this doesn't mean that there's no longer evil, evil in the world. Of course there's evil in the world. It means that because of Jesus, because of Christ's coming, that evil has been confronted and defeated and broken. And that those under its sway no longer have to be under its sway. They're, they are free now if they look to Christ. John 1.5 puts it beautifully. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. This is what Jesus came to do, to be the light in the world. But this also means freedom from the bondage of sin. We all struggle with bondages in our life. And you could just fill in the blank as to what maybe the sin you struggle with is, but we all struggle with it. The origin of evil, injustice, crimes, genocides, murders, and untold tragedies, this comes from the evil that works in people, people that are under the tyrant of sin, the tyrant of Satan. And that evil has been broken by the power of God. This is why Jesus came. He came to disarm the powers. Now, this doesn't mean that there is no longer sin in the world. Of course, people sin. But it means that we no longer have to be slaves to sin because his kingdom has come. There was a point where Jesus looked at his disciples square in the eye, and he said, the kingdom of God is in you. It's already there in germ form. And we have, to, we have to draw it out by seeking him, by declaring it, by living it, by trusting in his work. But the kingdom also does this. It brings a dramatic reversal to the way things are. That's what the kingdom does. A, a beautiful example of this is the Sermon on the Mount. If you've ever had a chance to read it in, in Luke 6, 20 through 26, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, it's, it's also called the Beatitudes. This set the culture of, of what Jesus wanted in the world, in his new kingdom. And for instance, to the poor, it says the kingdom belonged to them, to the poor. To the hungry, they will be satisfied. To those who weep, they will laugh. To those who suffer from rejection or marginalization or harm or hatred or abuse, for the sake of Christ, they should especially rejoice because their reward is in heaven. And the Beatitudes go on to say this, to those who rely on their wealth, and I'm paraphrasing, of course, to those who rely on their wealth, that is the only reward they will ever have. To those who brag about being full of the things they want in life and, and define themselves by their abundance, they will go hungry. To the laughing, they shall mourn. And popularity will not necessarily be a sign of God's blessing. In fact, it could be a sign of the opposite. So the Beatitudes broke in on the darkness of this world and said there's going to be a great reversal of all these things in his kingdom. And, and you can see spots of it here and there and little pinpricks of light here and there. So this great reversal is not something that will happen because of a political revolution because our favorite party got elected. But it will happen because God's kingdom has come. If you are a believer, a follower of Christ, you probably know by now that political solutions really don't work. What will work is the kingdom of God coming and transforming all things. But the kingdom also, it unites heaven and earth together. That's one thing it does that is powerful. It brings heaven and earth together. Often, you know, right now, heaven and earth are separated in a sense. And as a kid, I was always taught heaven is way far out there, and someday I'm going to go there and I'll have wings and maybe play a harp. And that is so far from the truth of what the Bible says about heaven. But right now, heaven and earth are separated. And even though sometimes light punches through the darkness and we get glimpse of, glimpses of heaven, we get moments of clarity, of, of revelation, and of, of, of the power and the presence of God in our life. But that's nothing compared to what is coming. And Jesus connected heaven in three ways, through parables, Parables 
make up one third of his teaching. And when something makes, makes up one third of, of whatever you say, you better listen because it's very serious. And Jesus used parables, and parable by the, main, by, by the way means side by side, when you compare something side by side, a heavenly truth with an earthly reality. That's what parables are. And the easiest, most efficient way for Jesus to explain the most profound truths of the universe was by illustrating them in stories that mimic everyday life. That's why he used parables. That's why children love stories because they learn about life through stories. And we all love stories. And stories help truth to go down easier and help us to, helps us to understand deep things much easier. Jesus gave no truth in pure form, it would be too heavy for any of us. So he couches them in parables. And parables are like a mirror of heaven reflecting the qualities through everyday earthly examples. And that's one, day that, one way that the kingdom joins, that, that the kingdom of heaven joins with earth. But another way is through power, through the power of God. We believe in the power of God. We believe in the power of healing and the power of miracles. And we have seen them through the years. We've seen, I remember as, as a little boy, I, I was very sick um, and I had just gotten saved. I'd just given my life to Christ and I was sick in bed and my ear was infected. I would get that every year, this, this awful ear infection. And it was the worst pain I ever had. It was so painful that even when you swallowed, especially when you swallowed, the pain would, would just was excruciating. And so every year I would dread it same time every year. So one day I was praying in bed. I said, God, please heal me. It hurts so much. And so I was half asleep and half awake. And I heard the words. I heard these words, you're healed. And when I woke up, I was healed. And I never again got that infection. Years later, God heals. And what, every time he heals, every time he does a miracle, it is the kingdom of heaven breaking in on the earth, saying one day that's going to be the status quo. One day that's going to be normal, the, the normal. And in some cases, it is the normal today, and it should be the new normal, shouldn't it? So Jesus performed miracles and healings, and he freed people possessed of evil spirits because part of him joining heaven and earth is him confronting these forces. Jesus told his disciples this, he said, cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. The kingdom of God is a sign. When you see miracles and healings, it's a sign that his kingdom is coming closer and closer to earth forever. And Jesus said this, because the third way it breaks through, the third way that, that, that the kingdom joins heaven and earth is by the presence of Jesus himself. And Jesus said this, he said, but if I, but, 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 but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come to you. In other words, it is proof because, because I'm, I'm confronting demonic evil. I'm, kind of, I'm confronting the evil. That's proof that I'm moving in the world. That's proof that the kingdom is coming and that it is here. So Clifton Black puts it this way, the kingdom explodes our ordinary world, it rattles it in mysterious ways that startle and defend us and begin the liberation of creation and society for their true destiny as God intends. God intends on bringing his kingdom to the earth. So when Jesus said, pray your kingdom come, what does he mean? He means this, it is to pray for God's rule to overtake the earth. God's not going to force people and, you know, like some dictator. He wants people to choose him. He wants people to yield their lives to him. And it means that seeing the coming of God's kingdom is, is, is the only solution that will change the world. It's not going to be a political solution. It's not going to be a, a technology solution that's going to change the world. It's going to be the kingdom of God coming because all solutions must bow down before him. And now we find that in this Easter season, pray for God's kingdom to come is to pray God continue what Jesus started and let it grow every day. Let it swell in brilliance every day until your return, Lord. But it is also this. It is also to pray that heaven and earth 
will continue to intersect until Jesus comes. That heaven and earth become closer and closer and closer. That's why he says, on earth as it is in heaven. God's culture in heaven is coming to earth. And it is here, it is here and there in spots. It is here and there as it breaks in in the darkness. We find that when we pray, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we're saying, Lord, let your mindset, let your culture, let your attitudes, let your government, let all these things that happen in, in the kingdom of heaven become natural on earth. And that will happen in its perfect form, in its full form when Jesus returns. In the book of Revelation, at the end of all things, heaven is coming down to earth to become one reality. But maybe you're thinking today, well, I thought heaven was a place that people are going to escape away from this awful world and this ugly, awful world is here and heaven is way over there and that's where we're going to go and we're all going to just float on clouds. You know? Well, if you read the scriptures very carefully, th there's a scripture that's interesting, but it could, be, it could be misleading if you don't really understand what it's saying. Jesus once, he once told the governor of Pilate, he says, my kingdom is not of this world or my people would fight. And in other words, when you first read that, you're like, wow, so this is a, an other, otherly world idea that we're just going to go over there. And, you know, and, and so, so we, there's no fight here. We just kind of wait for Jesus to return, and then we go with him, and, and it's, it's all over. But this doesn't mean that the kingdom of God is some faraway place, that we have to wait to die to get there. It means this, that the kingdom did not originate in this world nor does it hold sway, nor does it hold to the world's system of values. That's what it means. That his kingdom is not of a quality of this world. That's what he meant. That, that what Jesus was after was not a political revolution that would change the world, but a spiritual revolution that would transform everything. But it is also this, and we're going to pray in a moment, to pray, let your kingdom come, is to pray, let your will be done through me. In other words, it's not about me just going to church. If all I do is go to church or watch online and do nothing else that is connected to his kingdom, then I have to ask myself, am I really part of his kingdom? Our greatest enemy, again, can be our individuality, that our desire that we want to be the God of our own life that maybe we'll take a little bit of religion over here in our little box on Sunday, but then the rest of the week I do whatever I, I want to with my life, and my life really belongs to me. But yet, if Jesus is also the king of the kingdom, then it means he's the sovereign of the kingdom, and it means that I am not the sovereign. So when I pray, let your kingdom come, I'm saying, Lord, rule my life. Be in charge of my life, and let my life reflect your kingdom in the world. It's asking God's kingdom to come in a way that, that it addresses, that my life, that the way that I live addresses the brokenness of the world. That my life in Christ is not just a religious person who attends church. And asking the kingdom of God to come means that our relationship with God is not limited to just worship, but it's requesting that God act in the world through me it's saying, God, use my, my time, use my gifting, use whatever abilities I have for your glory so that I can help someone to find you and be part of your kingdom. So again, this does not happen by just attending church, but by living in such a way that my life has impact in the world and has meaning in the world because I'm part of his kingdom. So God doesn't abandon his creation. He redeems his creation. That's what it means for his kingdom to come. But as we close, we're going to close in prayer in a moment here. The kingdom, there's something about the kingdom I want to, I want to share. This kingdom, it, it's not like a club you can just join. You don't just fill out a card and say, I'm, I'm a part of the kingdom. You have to be born into it. You have to have, the, in a sense, the blood of Jesus pouring through your spiritual veins, through your DNA. 
There was a man named Nicodemus who was a very famous teacher in the scriptures, well-respected, very respectable man. He was one of the very few leaders of the time that did not criticize Jesus. He, he didn't abuse him verbally. He was very kind to him and very thoughtful. And he once asked about this, he, you know, hey, what do I do to be part of this kingdom? And Jesus very simply said, you must be born again. What? <laughs> Jesus was talking about such a radical change of heart that you're changing your whole paradigm, you're changing your whole spiritual DNA, such a transformative experience that it's like being born in a new way. That's what happens when we become part of the kingdom. A birth takes place, a new birth, a new way of thinking, a new way of seeing the world, a new way of seeing our lives, a new way of seeing the darkness and the light, a new way of seeing my past and my future and even my present. That's what it means to be born again. And we find that maybe, maybe you're listening today and maybe, maybe your foot is one side in the kingdom and maybe one side somewhere else. Or maybe you're wondering, what is all this kingdom business? What does all this stuff mean? Why should I care about the kingdom? Let me, let me put it to you this way. God loved you so much in John 3.16, it says that he, he loved the world, he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son the only son he ever had, Jesus. And he loves you and he loves me that much. And he loved us even when we didn't love him. He loved me when I was his enemy, when I was running around in New York City in the gangs as a kid, as a, as a youth. He still loved me then, and he loves you. But maybe, maybe you're a good churchgoer. Maybe you're faithful. Maybe you're very good at, you know, giving giving gifts and, you know, singing and doing all these things. And maybe you're not really part of the kingdom. Maybe you're part of a church group. But are you part of his kingdom? Have you been birthed into it? Let's pray. Jesus, we look to you by faith, and we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are so good to us. You loved us even when we were your enemies. Even when we didn't love you, you loved us. Lord, we know that you want to bring your kingdom to the world through the hearts of people because you never move unless you move through people. And you don't boss them into it. You don't force them into it. You want them to look to you in worship and yield to you the only will that you've given them and say, Father, take my life. So if that's you as we pray, ask the Lord to take your heart, to take your will, and that his kingdom would come into your life, that he would birth you into his kingdom so that you know you belong to him. And as we pray, maybe you've been partially in the kingdom and partially in, the, in another kingdom. One thing about God is, is he wants full allegiance in all things. We can't have it both ways. You can't be partially born. I'm either born or I'm not. So Lord Jesus, we ask you for that person that maybe they've gotten away from you during this season, during this difficult crisis we're going through as, as a world, as a country and a world. Yet you're so faithful. You're so good to us. So I'm asking you to give that person the courage to return to you and to come back in fullness and full surrender to you. So we ask that you save. We ask that you strengthen and encourage. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. If you gave your life to Christ, I want you to go to our website, and right front and center, you're going to see a, a flyer that says next steps or what's next. And there is a, a devotional there. 12-part devotional there that you can start to get you started. Feel free to contact the church. You can contact us two ways. Info at destinychristianniagara.com or you can call the church and leave a message and we'll make sure we get back to you. Our, our number is on the website, top left-hand corner. And if you would like to partner with us in giving, here are some ways. And until next time, it's so glad to be with you. God bless you and thank you.